This unit is going to cover pathogenicity and epidemiology. So what does that mean? That means that this is a bunch of terminology you have to know in a microbiology course so that later on when you talk about disease, you will know how to apply the terms to that particular disease. So the ability of an organism to cause disease, pathogenicity, and a pathogen is a organism that causes disease. The degree to which a pathogen can cause disease is called virulence, and sometimes it's called the virulence factor. Smallpox is very virulent, has a high virulence factor, whereas chickenpox has a lower virulence factor. Even though so many people a year actually die of chickenpox, and it's probably a person immunocompromised, it's not as the virulence factor is not as high as smallpox so the amount of virulence involved is how how sick does a particular microbe make a person invasiveness and toxigenicity of microorganisms two main causes of virulence are invasiveness which is the ability to break down tissues and get inside of a host and toxigenicity is the ability to produce toxins staphylococcus aureus is an organism that produ produces what are called exotoxins. So do Streptococcus pyogenes, all kinds of different microbes. And I'll show you examples of those. So under invasiveness, and what I'm gonna do, this is not going to be a long, exhaustive video. Uh, these are terms you just need to read on your own. I'm gonna pick out a few of these. Uh, enzymes, uh, we covered this in a previous unit. Enzymes act upon substrates. It's like the lock and key idea. Enzymes have a certain shape, and so they're going to bind to a certain substrate. And now we're talking about enzymes that are, have the ability to actually break down tissue. Hyaluronidase breaks down connective tissue. And then this one, collagenase, has the ability to break down collagen in skin. If you're going, what does that mean? Well, there you go. Uh, this is actually a real picture from a hospital that I worked at. This is necrotizing fasciitis. It's, called, it's a streptococcus pyogenes infection. And that organism produces hyaluronidase and collagenase, which can break down the dermis in skin. So that person's skin is gone. This is when it's been removed, of course. Um, you see how smooth the edges are? But that's what that means. It has the ability to break down. In fact, it's using the skin as energy. Alpha toxins, um, we don't have it in here. Um, it's alpha mongrel toxin is a toxin found in snake venom. And that destroys red blood cells. Kinases um, affect blood clotting by breaking down fibrin. That means that something that produces kinases will cause bleeding because fibrin is something that comes from fibrinogen and fibrin is the part that actually causes a clot. Leukocytins break down white blood cells. Uh, hemosins can break down red cells. Hemo refers to blood. Uh, coagulase causes plasma to clot. So this actually causes clots, um, whereas kinases prevent clotting. Capsules, we talked about these, pili, flagella, we already kind of covered those. Flagella move the entire cell. Anything with capsules, they resist being broken down. Um, a glycocalyx is something that is often referred to as a capsule. Uh, microbe can use glucose from the diet, produce a sticky outer layer, allows them to adhere to a tissue. These M proteins, um, when you leave out uh, food at room temperature, some bacteria can produce uh, toxins that have these type of proteins. So even when you cook the food, it doesn't break down the toxins. So if you have hamburger meat that's set out all day and you cook it, it's going to kill the bacteria inside. But if it hasn't been refrigerated properly, bacteria in there can have produced, can have, that's a good term, uh, will have produced toxins and the toxins are not going to be destroyed by the heat. Mycobacterium tuberculosis has a waxy cell wall. In fact, you have to do a really special kind of stain called an acid fast stain to see Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the bacteria that causes TB. And um, yeah, they have a waxy cell wall. Prevents them from drying out. They can actually stay for long periods of time. 
Okay, so under toxins, I'm not sure why that's so big uh, right there. Um, anyway, I may do a little uh, cleanup on this little outline, but so toxins, there are exotoxins which are released to the outside of a cell, and I didn't really show, this is impetigo, whoop, uh, that is uh, pink eye, and then this is uh, pink eye on steroids, this is thrush, um, that's actually Neisseria, gonorrhea, now um, we just kind of covered here, and I went kind of quick, I'm sorry, I didn't really mean to, but um, the appearance of either a capsule, and if you remember on part of the prokaryotic cell, we were talking about fembrae, these little extensions, well, they stick to things, and that's what happens. That's, that's got, this is gonorrhea, causes pus formation in the urethra, and you can look at that. There are pictures for this. This is uh, Carposi sarcoma, skin cancer. That's syphilis. Um, that's actually a, the second stage of syphilis, all the lesions. That's an AIDS patient that had mushrooms growing in their gums because uh, the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, they can't, all, they can't fight off infection. Okay, so here's some examples. Coagulase, see it's causing uh, clotting, and then here's kinase, which I told you actually prevents clotting. Um, but bacteria produce coagulase clot forms. Bacteria later produce kinases dissolving the clot and releasing bacteria. Um, some microbes can do that. It allows them to spread to body tissues. Uh, flagella. Yes, they move now uh, the entire cell. Now this is what I was trying to get to. So we're at the point of toxin. So an exotoxin. Uh, some act on tissues. Some are more specific for damage. They're produced by what are called gram-positive bacteria. Uh, we kind of talked about that earlier, especially in lab, what makes something gram-positive. Um, anyway, here's an exotoxin. Now, endotoxins are found in what are called gram-negatives, and you see those here. They're not exposed to a person's bloodstream or immune system unless the cell is broken down. This is one of the reasons that it's really hard to be a doctor and a pharmacist and a chemist that makes drugs. If you give a person a drug that's so strong that it wipes out all flora in the body, you're going to make a person more sick because there is what is called normal flora, and a huge percentage of those are gram negatives in the gut and if you start killing off huge amounts of gram negative bacteria you're going to get these toxins released and a person's going to get toxic you know toxic blood toxigenicity which would make them worse off but here are, here's an exotoxin it says proteins produced inside pathogenic bacteria mostly gram positives um, while they're growing and you know they can cause all kinds of issues um, following, it says following license as well but uh, toxins, uh, the, a person's brain, the medulla, the vomit center in a person's brain is very sensitive to toxins. If you were to eat food and you're throwing up 30 minutes later or otherwise, um, that's a food toxogenicity thing. Okay, a cytotoxin. Toxin affects cell function or kills the cell. Um, pertussis, cluster, um, Yeah, pertussis, I'm sorry, whooping cough, sorry, my blank, it makes a toxin that paralyzes the cilia in the throat, person coughs too much. Enterotoxins are found, this is primarily affect the intestinal tract, causing destruction of intestinal mucosa. Neurotoxins, that's tetanus, uh, clostridium tetani, uh, it makes a neurotoxin that, that blocks some pathways for the muscles to relax, short version. It blocks what is called reciprocal innervation, meaning when a person contracts their arm, like their bicep, normally the triceps relax. Tetanus causes full body tetanic contractions. Um, an antitoxin is what is given basically, it says uh, protective molecules called antibodies. Uh, you can get injections of those. They're like snake venom type thing, you know, vaccination. Um, a toxoid is what is used in vaccination. So you can give somebody a toxin, like for instance, a snake venom, and um, their body develops immunity for it. And like I was saying, endotoxins, those are found in gram-negative bacteria. They're only exposed if the cell is lysed. 
and that's what that's saying right there. Causes fever, uh, pyrogenic fever causing. Okay, the last, uh, and I'm going to just kind of go through this kind of quickly. Um, the type of infections, so primary is initial infection to a body part. Secondary is a secondary infection that could be as a result of the primary infection, like it says there, due to weakened condition. Uh, opportunistic is where normal flora have the chance to overgrow. That's what a yeast infection is. Vulvovaginitis is what it's called. It's a fungus called Candida albicans. It's a part of normal flora of the genital urinary tract of females, and it can overgrow, and that's what thrush is, a lot of things. Um, chronic infections can be long-term. Now, this is an interesting one here. Subclinical, that means no symptoms. Uh, a lot of STDs sometimes, uh, male and female side, can be subclinical, meaning the male could have symptoms and the female not. If they're not having symptoms, they're subclinical. And a super infection would be something like MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus. That's where it's something that's really hard to kill. It may be resistant to antibiotics. Obviously you want to avoid those. This is a big long paragraph here. Nosocomial infection is an infection that is acquired while a person is in the hospital. Uh, well, yeah, communicable disease, okay, well anyway. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's acquired while in the hospital. And then latent means that it could be a disease, a person's asymptomatic. Once again, that's really popular dialogue nowadays. Uh, it means a person um, it says can be often asymptomatic, but they could possibly be, where well, they're infected, they have no symptoms, and maybe could give it to somebody else. All right. So um, just one quick term, local could be one area of the body. If you ever see systemic, that means body-wide, entire bodies involved. Now, communicable diseases, these are ones that are spread by direct contact, like it says here, those that can be transmitted from person to person. A carrier does not exhibit symptoms of a disease, uh, but can still transmit to others. And once again, this is really relevant talk for today. Uh, sporadic is a disease that shows up, like it says here, sporadically. Ebola, if you want to look that disease up, is a disease that will show up irregularly often. So this is something that's not common. Might show up, have an outbreak, and then have it go away. There was a famous story about uh, a long time ago about a, a tribe in Africa that um, a person died of a type of encephalitis. They call that brain fever brains infected and part of the ritual when a person died was the family members ate a person a piece of the person's brain and of course it was being spread that way <laughs> so you had uh, all of a sudden out of nowhere you had people dying and that's like a sporadic outbreak an endemic is a small area that's involved uh, it's limited an epidemic and it is a larger area now sometimes you can see that as called as a country like the United States as an epidemic um, once again very relevant topics pandemics worldwide affecting everywhere so uh, and I thought maybe and I guess it's not showing these pictures not really changing but that's what that's referring to <laughs> okay last part of this transmission of disease Direct contact is person to person. Indirect contact uh, this is an inanimate object such as fomites. A fomite is like a table, anything that's not living. Could be anything, bed sheets, tissues, gloves, needles, like I said, all kinds of um, things. Metal often is not great at transmitting disease because it's so dry and extreme in temperature, but Needles can be. And droplet transmission, um, person sneezing. So here's direct contact. I'm going to leave it on this. Uh, it's contact that involves physical contact between a source and a host. Indirect, person's picking up. Look, these are, look like uh, scissors. There's some gauze, blood, you know, inanimate objects involved. There's a sneeze. <laughs> of all things. Um, involves mucilage, mucilage, 
mucus droplets that travel only a short distance. Uh, waterborne is getting it. Drinking bad water. If you're ever stranded anywhere, you're not supposed to drink water that doesn't move. Uh, or water's not treated, really. But water that's stagnant has billions of little protozoans in it. Food bo foodborne is eating either food that is not cooked properly or has not been refrigerated properly. You can eat raw food. Raw fish? No, there might be things in it. But something, as far as meat, that has not had a chance to sit out, and it's called temperature abuse when you leave food out for long periods. Um, but yeah, you obviously, if you eat undercooked pork and, and chicken, salmonellosis comes to chicken. Airborne, that's not droplet transmission. Droplet is sneezing, coughing. Airborne is just being in the room with somebody. Uh, and it's kind of trying to show there, microbes can can attach to dirt in the air and uh, viruses can actually float in the air a little bit. Vectors are arthropods that transmit disease. Those are kind of scary. Mosquitoes. There, there's some graph somewhere. I'll try to find it. It shows all the animals that cause the most deaths every year and it's mosquitoes. You know, although mosquitoes an insect but you know, you're talking about uh, alligator attacks or crocodiles and, and hippopotamus, all those things. But mosquito is always the top of the list. Mechanical transmission is contact with the insect's body like flies or cockroaches. Even those flies can bite. And there are some diseases spread by being by fly bites. Um, biological transmission is being bitten by a um, arthropod or vector. It ends up storing in the salivary glands of an insect, like if they're going to transmit like West Nile virus, it doesn't affect the mosquito. But if a, if a mosquito bites a person that has a virus or disease, like African sleeping sickness, or even malaria, the Anopheles mosquito um, spreads malaria and bites a person that has it, then flies around and bites somebody who does not have it. So that's how vectors work. Okay, now some of these pictures, uh, they're not great. These are portals of entry. How can a microbe get inside of a human being? Obviously, any body system that opens to the outside. Um, and then here it's like nose, eyes, ear. Um, the coronavirus, COVID, that caused a worldwide pandemic was thought to be really spread by the eyes, by con basically entering through the eyes. So optometrists had to shut down during that pandemic. It was thought that was the easiest way for a person to get it. Uh, broken skin, skin flakes. Uh, well, broken skin, if skin is the first line of defense, if it's, if it's cut or torn, it's an easy entryway for microbes. And then basically all of these, vagina, urethra, seminal vesicles, um, mouth is considered the digestive system, anus, um, any body system that opens to the outside. Um, and that says, now this is saying portals of exit. Um, it's the same with entry, and that's, that's why it says that. But it's showing entry here, conjunctiva, the eyes, Broken skin, anus, um, basically the same pathways. But yeah, any opening to the outside is uh, considered a portal of entry. And broken skin would be one of those. The last part to this, um, there, is, there actually are what are called the five stages of the disease. And once again, a very relevant topic. The part called the incubation period is time interval between initial infection and the first appearance of signs or symptoms. So that what that means is a person could be sick but not have any symptoms. So they're essentially like a carrier even though they're not sick yet and can get other people sick. It just varies from person to person. A fungus infection can take three weeks to show up. So it was called um, uh, ringworms. When I was in high school, I actually thought it was a worm. A ringworm is a fungus infection. And if it showed up on a person's face or skin, it's like a, it caused a, uh, a skin blemish. 
means they probably got it three weeks earlier. The prodromal period is the time between the incubation period and the person actually being sick. Uh, prodromal could have some early mild symptoms to it. A lot of times doctors will say if you get a lot of sleep, you feel like you're getting sick, you feel like you're about to get sick. I think people know that feeling. That's the prodromal period. Illness is full-blown symptoms. Um, like it says here, here's a whole list. Overt symptoms of disease, fever, chills, muscle pain, myalgia, uh, photophobia. If some people don't want to be in a room with light, headaches, that kind of thing. Sore throat, lymph node enlargement. Now, decline is when a person is actually, and, and during the illness period, it's when their immune system is in full effect. You know, fighting the disease, building up, a, uh, producing cells. We'll cover that later. Body's producing B cells and T cells and something called complements involved. But decline is where, it says a period where signs and symptoms may subside. Now, the thing about decline, depending on what a person had, if you're really sick and your immune system, it's like a, it's an army. And it, help, it actually breaks down your body in the process of fighting an infection. During the decline period, some people might be susceptible to getting sick again, which is why you want to take all your medicine. Don't stop halfway through, even though you're feeling better. If you've gone to the doctor and they've given you drugs, you take them all. And then convalescence is supposed to be uh, recovery. A person's convalescing, they're in recovery. But there's a point there in convalescence where a person is in full, they've retained their strength, and they're no longer sick. Um... All right, and that's the five stages of disease, okay? So I hope these videos help. Thanks for joining me.